If you have not done so, let's turn to Mark chapter 5. Uh, so as we're walking through the, the gospel of Mark, remember we're doing, not going to do everything here on Sundays. We're also going through Mark in our, our uh, daily devotionals, Monday through Thursday. So you can, if you, uh, we skip a verse that you want to hear about, c- check it out on uh, our daily devotionals and you can find it there. So far, we've been focusing, as Jesus has focused, on what it means to be a disciple, who the disciples are, what God expects of you and me. We've talked about John the Baptist as an example of a disciple, as a disciple who gets his message from Jesus, who's single-mindedly focused on Jesus, and who points others towards Jesus. We talked last week about who makes a good disciple, right? And we said, it's the misfit people, the island of misfit toys, those who are broken, those who are sick, those who are sinners, those who have been wounded, that is who makes a disciple. Somebody who comes to Jesus with their brokenness, with their sin, repents and follows him. That's who makes a good disciple. And today we're going to talk about what is expected of a disciple. Now, I know you're probably like me. When you hear the word disciple, the first thing you think about is the 12 disciples, those 12 men that Jesus chose to be specifically called out, and a better word that we're going to use for them would be apostle, Uh, but the point is, as Mark makes clear, a disciple is not just one of the 12, a disciple is anybody who's following after Jesus, a disciple really is a learner, so you are a disciple of something or somebody, you are learning how to live your life somewhere, But as Christians, we are called to be disciples only of Jesus, not learning from other people, not learning from other directions, not learning from the world, but from Jesus. But again, also, it's really easy to read the Gospels, to hear preachers, to read stories about how God is working around the world, and to wonder, I can't do that. What does God really expect of me? Have you ever felt that way? Yeah. I, I can't go be, maybe you say, uh, listen, I, I can't live without some of these luxuries that I have in life. I can't go on a mission trip. I'm too old to go on a mission trip. I have health concerns. I can't do it. Have you ever felt that way? We read the Bible and we talk about the ways that God works in miraculous ways. People that risk their lives. People that give their lives. We look at the Bible. We look at stories in our world today. We talk about missionaries. That's not me, you say. How can I? What does God expect of me? And I think today, our text is going to answer that in a very important way. So we are going to talk a little bit about the the apostles and those who were called by God for some specific reasons. But I want you to remember that God's call, God's call is to every single one of us who claim the name of Jesus. And it really is the same call. It's expressed in different ways. You remember, we preached through the book of Acts. Acts 1.8 says, Jesus says that we are to be his witnesses, say it with me, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. And just briefly, we won't re-preach that sermon, that means that we're to be witnesses in our homes to the people we love, to the people that we hate, to the people that are close and the people that are far. And in case somebody doesn't fall into that category, Jesus says, to the very ends of the earth, to every single person. The call is to give witness. And that's what our text is going to focus on today. It would help if I turned to the text as well. You don't want me to call on you to read, do you? Brooke's Brooke's ready. I appreciate that, Brooke. I know most of y'all would be terrified if I started calling people out to read the text each Sunday, right? Everybody's looking back. No, that's not me, right? All right. Join me in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 20. Mark. Did I do it again? Mark 5. Mark 5. I don't know why I keep saying Matthew. Mark 5, 1 to 20. They went across the lake to the region of Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. 
This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him, and he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me! For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. When Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding out in the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. And he gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bake into the lake and was drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town in the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. Vicky grew up taking care of pigs. That'd scare you, wouldn't it? If that happened, you run inside. You don't know what just happened to the pigs. Verse 15, and when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it, seen it, told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then Jesus began, excuse me, then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. And as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has made, had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Well, let's for a minute just think about this incredible encounter. This man, uh, well, take a step back. Jesus is actually, if you're not, uh, you haven't boned up on your geography of the Holy Land, when Jesus crosses over, over the, this is the Sea of Jordan, it calls it the lake, the sea, different names in different places. The Sea of Jordan, Jesus crosses over into this area, specifically the land of the Gerasenes. And at the end of our text, he says, in the Decapolis, this is a Gentile, non-Jewish reason. Decapolis just means the ten cities, and it's a group of cities that are on the other side of the Jordan River who are not Jewish. So that's really important to begin with. We, we open this story with Jesus leaving the Jewish people, the people that he is from, the people that are like him, to a different people. So we begin immediately here with Jesus leaving his comfort zone, or maybe we should say taking his 12 disciples from their comfort zone with him into a new place to proclaim the good news and the gospel. When they get, show up there, who's the first one that greets them? A naked, demon-possessed, bleeding man with chains on his wrists and hands. A wonderful welcoming party, right? That's exactly the person you want as people come on the shore. And Jesus instantly recognizes that this is not just a man. This is a man possessed by a legion of demons. That's why he's strong. That's why he won't wear clothes. That's why he can't be bound. That's why he's living amongst the tombs. That's why he's cutting himself. This man is possessed and controlled by the minions of Satan. Now before we go any further, this is not the main topic of our text today, but we have to stop and recognize that the demonic world is real and powerful. We talked about this a little bit, spiritual warfare, as we finished the book of Ephesians, right? Paul tells us to put on the full armor of God because our battle is what? Not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces. And here is a perfect example of the spiritual forces that are real and active. Now, we, especially, it's Halloween's coming up. Maybe most of y'all don't care. I don't care at all about Halloween. Some of y'all love Halloween. That's fine, whatever. But it's a a perfect opportunity to, to recognize 
that Satan is real and Satan is at work. And I'm not here to tell you that if you celebrate Halloween that you're worshiping the devil or you're going to hell or anything like that. But I do think we need to recognize that the demonic world is real. And when we invite the demonic into our lives, we're toying with things that are very destructive. When we invite Satan in, he wreaks havoc in our lives. And the incredible thing is, as a Christian, Satan has no power over you except what you give him. Because look at what Jesus does. Before Jesus even opens his mouth, what do these demons do? They see him, and they come and bow before him. To this point, nobody has spoken to Jesus with such a magnificent title but the demons. And they beg him, please, don't torment us. Let us go live in these pigs. They have no power. They have no authority except what we allow them to have in our lives. The demonic is real. The demonic is powerful. This man on his own had no hope. He didn't know Jesus. He didn't know what to do. He wasn't in control. We have no idea how he got the demons, but he couldn't do anything about it. Everybody around him tried. They bound him. They tried to take care of him. At this point, they've given up because they're terrified. But Jesus, one man, shows up and a legion of demons. This, in the Roman military, I think your, some of your Bibles will actually say how much a legion is. It's something like 5,600 soldiers, I think that's the right number, in the, in the Roman military. So I don't know if that's literally how many demons there were, but the name legion means a whole bunch, a lot, all in this one man. And the Son of God shows up and with a word defeats them. So the demonic world is real. The demonic world will torment you. If you allow it in your lives, you face a world of hurt. But we have a Savior who at one word can defeat them all. So it's a situation this morning in our Sunday school class, we talked about Daniel in the lion's den. And we had one question that said, was Daniel scared when he was going to the lion's den? What do you all think? Was he scared? terrified have any of y'all ever seen a lion I've seen a lion in a zoo watched it eat and I don't want anything to do with it I wasn't really confident that fence they had between me and the lion would do much good if he really wanted to get to me but nonetheless da Daniel knowing how God could work knowing who God was and ready to give his life was terrified but faced it nonetheless when we face the demonic world it is real there is power there is is danger and destruction but we have a king and a savior who with one word can defeat that enemy so it's scary it shouldn't be taken lightly but we should also face that world with victory in mind because we have a savior who fights for us and that's not even the main point of what we're talking about today but it's important to remember and recognize so as Jesus heals this demon-possessed man, the demoniac, this man who has been tormented, the people immediately recognize something's different, right? Jesus showed up to proclaim good news. The demons recognize him and ask to be sent into the pigs, and Jesus accommodates. The townspeople come, and they recognize something strange has happened, and what happens? They all worship God? They're scared. What do they say to him? They have a request too. They said, get out of here. Leave us alone. We don't want you. And Jesus accommodates. And as Jesus is leaving, rejected by these people, what does the formerly demon-possessed man do? He comes to Jesus and begs, let me come with you. Now at first thought, right, what have we been reading about? Jesus is getting together a group of people, right? Jesus is, is getting, forming his group of disciples, his inner circle, others who are following him. This seems like a pretty good guy to take with you, right? He can get up and speak to people, and he's got a really cool testimony, right? If you're going on a revival tour, you want somebody that can give that 
good, strong testimony. This is how I lived, and this is what Jesus did. Don't you want it too, right? And Jesus says what? No, you can't come with me. But nonetheless, Jesus has a purpose for this man. Let's pause here for just a minute. We're going to come back to this man in just a second. I just want to remind you. We're not going to read all these texts, but we are going to look. You can write it down and and read it all later. A few chapters before in Mark 3, uh, beginning in verse 13, is when Jesus actually names his 12 closest apostles, the 12 men who were with him. We've talked about some of these already. We talked about Levi, the tax collector, last week in our devotions during the week. We've talked about uh, Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and we're going to be introduced to some more of these, but I'll just give you, uh, well, I am going to read this. You don't have to go there if you don't want to, you just want to listen, do that, but it says in Mark 3.13, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that, they might, that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. He called these 12. Listen, there were lots of people. And he called 12 that they might go out and preach and cast out demons and heal people. He gave them authority. Now there's a word that we use. I've already used it once. For, for these 12, we call them apostles. We could say apostles with a big A. That means it's a specific group of people. The word apostle simply means someone who is sent out. If you want a word in our modern world that probably matches best, listen, it's missionary, all right? We hear the term apostle and we think about somebody that's more important, more strong. Some people give themselves the name apostle, right? Let me just pause for a minute. If somebody claims the name of apostle, you need to be a little bit apprehensive, all right? But nonetheless, an apostle is simply someone who is sent out. Jesus chose these 12 not to be the boss, not to be an authority, but to go out specifically for a purpose. And you can read about it, uh, not, not right this minute, but in, in Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 6, is where Jesus sends them out on their first missionary project. He sends them out and they preach and they cast out demons and they heal people and they do the work that Jesus has, going out away from their homes to do work specifically called by God. Now they're called apostles, they're called for a specific purpose, but what's their job from Acts 1-8? To be my witnesses, witnesses to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Witnesses. The same call look expressed in different ways. To be my witnesses. What does Jesus expect of me? Looking back at our demon, there's no good way to talk about this guy. I wish Jesus get, told us his name. The formerly demon-possessed man. How would you like to be defined by your former self your whole life? For 2,000 years, this guy has been defined by his worst moment, right? The formerly demon-possessed man wants to go with Jesus. And Jesus says, no. Side note, some of the things that we want most, Jesus says no to because he's got a greater plan than we could ever imagine. Some of y'all might need to hear that today. But Jesus does not only say no. What does he say? Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Go home and tell him what he has done for you. Be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. What does Jesus expect of you and of me? This is it. We could talk a lot. Jesus gives lots of instructions. I was reading just this morning in Luke's gospel Take up your cross and follow me. Remember the three men who come to Jesus and the first man says, let me come with you, Jesus. And Luke, it's in Luke 9. He says, 
The foxes have holes, the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. The next guy says, hey, let me come with you, but let me go bury my father. And Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. The third guy comes and says, Jesus, I want to follow you, but let me just go check on my home real quick. And Jesus says, anyone who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy to be a disciple of me. That's pretty tough. And those texts are just as essential to what it means to be a disciple as what Jesus is saying here. But the first and foremost, the, the thing that we have to see first is that when Jesus calls us to salvation, he gives us all the call to be his witness. I think often in Christian circles, at least in the circles I grew up in, and maybe you did too, we, we have this, this, the way we talk about uh, being a Christian, we talk about being saved, right? We get saved, and that's a defining moment in our lives, which it should be. But then we think about another time when God calls us to what he wants us to do, right? I'm, I was saved at this point, but then God called me to do this later. God called me to be a pastor, missionary, doctor, nurse, teacher, family, whatever. God called me at this point. But in the Bible, do you know what we see almost all, every time? At the same moment Jesus calls to salvation, he calls to give witness. We can't separate the call to salvation and the call to give witness. If we do that, we separate what God has brought together. We separate our Christian lives. Now God does call to different specific mi missions, even in the life of the Apostle Paul, remember, G G Jesus saved him and called him to give witness immediately. He said, at the moment of salvation, Jesus tells Saul that you will be my witness to the Gentiles, right? But as Paul, Saul, Paul, remember the same name, Jesus changes his name, as Paul is going through his ministry, God redirects him, doesn't he? You remember, to me, it's, it, to me it's one of the most baffling moments in the book of Acts when Paul says, I was trying to go to Asia to share the gospel, but God wouldn't let me. Have you ever, I wanted to go tell people about Jesus, but he stopped me. Why? Because the Macedonian man was about to call and God wanted him to, so God can redirect where we carry out our witness. He can change it and do all kinds of different things. But the moment you accepted Christ as Savior is the moment that you accepted the, the call to give witness to his name. You accepted your most important assignment, your overarching assignment, the assignment for your life the moment you accepted Christ. And it's no different for those first 12 than it is for you who today might accept Jesus. He said to, to Peter and Andrew, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He says to this man, essentially, can I, can I have a little, little liberty in it? Go home and fish for men there. These 12 that he calls, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Matthew, uh, Two Judases, James, Thomas, Thaddeus, he calls these men and he says, you're going out into deeper waters. I'm giving you a special name, the sent out ones, the apostles, the missionaries, because you're going to go somewhere else. You're going to go farther away. You're going to leave everything you know. But to this demoniac, formerly demon-possessed man, he says, you're going to fish for men, but you're going to stay in your little fishing pond right next to your house. You're going to stay in the waters that you've been in your entire life. I'm not at all a fisherman, but I understand. Some people get to go into deep, deep waters and deep sea fishing and go all over the world to do it. But this man, Jesus said, no, you stay home and you fish in your little pond your whole life. Let me ask you, as Peter hung upside down, dying on a cross in Rome after preaching the gospel, after fulfilling what God called him to do. As John sat on the island of Patmos, exiled from civilization because he preached the gospel. Or this man, we don't know how he died, this man still living in this same region, the Decapolis, who was more faithful 
They, all, they were all faithful. They all did what Jesus told them to do, which is the same thing, just in a different place. What does Jesus expect of you and of me? And Andrew, fish for men, as he said to this man, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. What does Jesus expect of you? To tell people about what he's done for you. Some people read the, apostle, read the book of Acts, read Paul's letters, and we see these incredible theological discussions and discourses and standing before kings and standing before philosophers and standing before religious leaders and the smartest and most powerful people. We actually, uh, Paul's reason for going to Rome was so that he might stand before Caesar and proclaim the gospel. The most powerful man in the world at the time Paul was to go and stand before him. And that is terrifying for most of us to stand in front of two or three people it will give us a heart attack. But to stand before world leaders and people who, who, who've devoted their lives to their faith or opposing Christianity is terrifying. And the good news is that God has called some people to do that. God has called people to leave everything behind and go around the world. God has called people to stand before kings and presidents and proclaim. God has called some people to stand before persecutors and proclaim Jesus' name as they are burned at the stake or beheaded or arrested or their families are killed in front of them. And God has also called some people to stay home and tell people about what Jesus has done. And everything in between. I know so many of us who preach are guilty of preaching this kind of discipleship that elevates those who sacrifice everything. And yes, we, we do need to recognize and praise people who've given their lives and their, and their uh, everything for the sake of Jesus. But Jesus also calls us to stay and to share. The problem is most of us who aren't ready to, to be one of the 12, who aren't ready to risk our lives or give up everything or leave our homes or, or, or stand before world leaders who are not equipped to do so, the answer is more often than not that we stay home and do nothing. You see the difference. Jesus didn't say to the demon-possessed man, go home and just live your life. What did he say? Go home and tell people what I have done for you. Now do you think this crowd of people just told Jesus to leave? We don't want anything to do with you. Do you think he went home to a warm reception? No. He says, he goes to the farmers and he says, hey, Jesus saved me. And they said, yeah, but he got 2,000 of our pigs killed. It doesn't mean it'll be easy. It doesn't mean that our lives will be peachy and perfect. But the, the man or woman who God says, go home and tell them what I've done for you, is just as much in God's will as the one who leaves everything behind and ends up in prison for proclaiming the name of Christ. The only difference between you and somebody like Billy Graham who gets to preach to thousands is the audience. If you and I are faithful to share when God gives us the chance, we are faithful and we will receive our reward just as God intended. It's not your job to worry about the size of the crowd. It's not your job to worry about the audience. It's your job to go where Jesus tells you and to be faithful. And if he's kept you in your hometown or in a smaller area or in any particular place, that's where he wants you. The problem is not staying home. The problem is staying quiet. What does Jesus expect of a disciple? To give witness to what he has done in their life. 
I want to read one more parable of Jesus. I know we're jumping through Mark a little bit because I think it's important. Because often, maybe you're nothing like me, maybe you're a lot like me, maybe that scares you, I don't know. But if you ever got up to say something about Jesus and thought, nobody's going to listen to me. What do I have to say? Who cares what I have to say? Have you ever felt that way? I guess I'm the only one. All right. Steve, Steve kind of raised his hand. He doesn't want to. In Mark 4, there's a parable. You can turn there if you want, or you can just listen to me. Mark 4, beginning in verse 1. Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake. And while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge, he taught them many things by parables. In his, in his teachings, he said, Listen. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on the rocky place where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no roots. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so they did not bear fruit. And still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Now, if you continue reading, you can do that later. You can read actually Jesus' specific description of what it means. But let me just make it clear if you didn't see it. Jesus is saying, your job is to sow the seed to give a witness, to share the news of what Jesus has done for you. Does this farmer get scolded because the birds come and eat some of the seed? Does the farmer get scolded because some of the plants are too shallow and they have no roots? You keep answering, Kate. And does he get scolded because the sun comes out and burns it up? Does he get scolded because some ground is rocky? Does he even get praised because some of it hits the good soil and produces fruit? No, his job was to scatter the seed. God's job is to make it grow. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, he says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered the seed. Who gives the growth? God gives the growth. Your job is just like the formerly demon-possessed man, just like the farmer, to sow the seed. God's responsible for people's response. They're responsible for themselves. What is it? Not, not, Not right now. Your job is to sow the seed And let God do his work. Isaiah 55, 10 and 11. As the rain and the snow came down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seeds for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. In short, if you are faithful to share, if you spread the seed and do what God has called you to do, what Jesus has called you to do, yes, some people will laugh at you. Some people, let's be honest, the worst persecution you or I will probably face is somebody might slam a door in our face or get mad at us. Some people might make an initial response and then turn away. Some people might even accept Jesus so that you'll give them things, give them money, whatever. But some people, as the seed goes out, some people will hear it. And the gospel will grow and take root in their lives. And they will produce a yield 30, 60, 
a hundred times. Just like this woman that we saw in the shoeboxes. Judy, you can't even begin to tell us how many shoeboxes you packed over the years, can you? Thousands, right? Hundreds. I mean, what? James, hundreds, thousands, right? Maybe even just this year, right? Countless shoeboxes. And you have no idea what they've done. And statistically, probably most of the shoeboxes we send, kids get them and they're happy and they play with the toys. They hear the gospel. Who knows? But some people, this woman gets the box and years later looks at it again and gives her life to Jesus. And as a result, now she is making shoeboxes that are going around the world. This is a perfect example of how the gospel works. And one person was faithful, this one little girl that packed a shoebox and sent it to her. Maybe she packed hundreds, maybe she only packed one box, who knows. But the shoebox went and the gospel worked and grew and grew and grew. And years later, this woman is sending more shoeboxes around the world. When you are faithful to spread the seed, give a witness of what Jesus has done for you, God will work, and people will be saved. And you might only see one or two people respond, but those people might see 30, 60, 100, countless numbers. What does God expect of you as a disciple? To tell people what he has done for you, the mercy and the grace that you have received. Tell others. Now, what Kasha wants me to tell you about, it's already in my notes, but that's all right. This is what happens when you start letting people respond to you. Everybody feels free to talk, and that's okay. It's just a little scary. In Mark 7, now, I do want to give a disclaimer. There's, we can't say for certain that what I'm about to read is a result of this man but we can say that this man was the first person that Jesus told to share the gospel in the Decapolis. As we read, there's, there's a, an encounter that Jesus has, another episode in uh, Mark 7, verse 31. It says, Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis, the same place where the former demon-possessed man was told to share the good news. Now, when Jesus left, what were, they, what were the crowd saying to him? Get away. Leave us alone. We don't want you here. But when Jesus came back, if you jump ahead to verse 36 and 37, Jesus commanded them not to tell him. Okay, verse 37. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He had done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. The crowds were overwhelming Jesus, and he healed them and performed miracles. Now, we can't say for certain that this crowd that Jesus encounters in Mark 7 is a result of of the demon-possessed man. But we can say that this is exactly how God works. You might be called to go or to stay or to go somewhere else because you are the right person that God wants to share to this group of people or that group of people. Because let's be honest, some people aren't going to listen to me. Some people aren't going to listen to you. Some people, Jesus could show up and cast out a demon and they still want nothing to do with him, just like this crowd, right? But one formerly demon-possessed man just might be the one who can cast a seed that grows and spreads and impacts a whole region of the world that the next time Jesus shows up, everybody's desperate to see him. You don't know what will happen because of the seed that you throw out. You don't know who's going to respond because you're faithful one time or two times or three times or a hundred times. You don't know if you've been rejected over and over and over again 
at what point somebody will say, you know what, maybe I will try that. Maybe I will listen to you share. Maybe I will read that Bible. Maybe I will go to church with you. It's not your job to know. It's not your job to stress about it. It's your job to be faithful with what God has given you. What does God expect of you as a disciple of Jesus Christ? To give witness to what Jesus Christ has done in your life. The rest is up to him. And just like plants grow, because that's what they were made to do, just like the rain falls and waters the earth, just like God created it to, when God's word goes out, it does God's work. You can't stop it. You can't make it better. Your job is to speak it and share it and give witness to what Jesus has done for you. Father, we come before you today thanking you. I thank you that you work in incredible ways. That your power is great. Your authority is unmatched. You are the one who has the ability to save and to call people to you and to draw people in ways that we can't imagine. And for some unimaginable reason, you chose people like us to be an instrument of your gospel, to be the ones that do the sharing. I do pray, Lord, as, we, as, as I read this morning also in, in Luke's gospel, I pray, God, for more people to go out, as you called the twelve, to go to distant lands, as you have called so many of us. I pray for more but I pray even more that every single one of us, whether we go out, whether we stay home, whether we do something different, would give witness to what you have done in our lives, proclaiming your gospel so that people might hear and respond. God, I pray for the one who is here who might be discouraged because they keep sharing and nobody responds. They keep sharing and the ground is rocky or shallow or the sun is scorched it out or the weeds keep coming and pull it down. I pray that they would be faithful, that that one seed, maybe that they can't even see, that they don't realize was heard, that they don't know what happened to it, that that seed would find the right person that you might grow gospel in them. Lord, let us not grow weary of doing your work but that we might be witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. Let us proclaim your word and trust you to work in people's hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me invite you to stand. We're going to sing this song of invitation. I pray that you today would respond as Jesus calls. Maybe God is laying a specific person on your heart. Maybe God is telling you where he wants you to sow. Maybe you just need to today recommit yourself that you will be faithful in the place that God has put you. Don't leave without responding today. If you don't take anything else away, hear this. Jesus has called every one of us that are saved, that know him as Lord and Savior, to give witness. That's your job. Whatever it looks like, whatever else you do, however else you do it, whoever's listening, whatever the audience, give witness to what Jesus Christ has done for you.